Well, welcome to session six of the uh, conservative intellectual tradition in America. Uh, I'm Mallory Factor. I'm going to be your guide through this course. Today, we have a very exciting lecture on the emergence of libertarianism. Libertarianism and classical liberalism uh, and we're, is really a subject that we have not even begun to deal with yet. And today is going to be the beginning of looking at the different forms of conservatism. Our speaker, however, has a very strong bent in this area. He's a political activist, and he's also the current president and executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, which is a nonprofit organization in Irving, California, whose mission it is to promote Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And in 1998, he co-founded a financial advisory firm, BH Equity Research, of which he's presently managing director and chairman. Born in Israel and a member of the Israel Intelligence Service, former member, that is, he's co-author of Neoconservatism, an obituary, for an, an obituary for an idea, and he's also a contributor to Winning the Unwinnable War, America's self-crippled response to Islamic totalitarianism. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Yaron Brook. <clears throat> Thank you, Mallory. Um, this is a real pleasure, uh, particularly given the, uh, the lineup that you guys, I can't, I can't believe how lucky you 12 are in terms of the lineup of speakers that you have in this class. So it, it is a real honor for me to be part of that lineup. Um, and I think this topic is a really exciting topic right now. Uh, this question about the significance of libertarian ideas, even Ayn Rand's ideas, in the conservative movement right now, I think, is an important issue and a very, very relevant issue. And I'll just give you a, a few concretes to, to kind of make this real. Um, Obviously, the most striking example of, of libertarianism right now is, of course, the candidacy of Ron Paul. And uh, Ron Paul is running as a libertarian conservative. Uh, and I think has really shaken things up a little bit and, and for, forced other candidates to deal with certain economic issues, certain issues about what is the role of government that conservatives are not always comfortable dealing with and don't always want to deal with, certainly not kind of deal with this more extreme position that, that Ron Paul has taken up, this more radical position. Um, Ayn Rand has, has, has played a significant role, I think, in the last uh, year or so, no, actually last three years, uh, within the conservative movement. And really, she's played a role not so much among the candidates or among the leadership of the conservative movement, but in the Tea Parties. And if you've been to Tea Party demonstrations, um, then you've seen signs which say things like, Atlas is shrugging. Well, where does that come from? It comes from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Or signs that say, who is John Galt? Or if they were a little pretentious, they say, I am John Galt. A little pretentious, I think. But, but where does that come from? That's the opening line and a, and a really theme throughout the novel, Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged. And I think, again... Ayn Rand is challenging conservatism, is asking questions about conservatism that are crucial, particularly at this point in American history where we're faced with ever-growing government, ever-growing liabilities we can't pay for, and a real crisis in confidence in, in our system of government, in the way our government functions. And here are these challenges, both from a, a Ron Paul type, he calls himself a conservative libertarian, and an Ayn Rand who is different. We'll talk about in what ways different. But quite radical, particularly in, for conservatives to, I think, I think grapple with. Um, so I think it's really important to, to if you, when studying conservatism and studying conservatism in America, uh, both in terms of understanding the history uh, of, of kind of the impact of libertarian and, and Randian ideas on the conservative movement, but also, and maybe more importantly, in projecting out into the future. Uh, because it does look like these kind of ideas are bubbling up to the surface and maybe are going to have more of an impact on American politics as we move into the future than they have had in the past. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to start by 
you know, giving you a little bit of background on kind of the history of, of, of the libertarian, the modern libertarian movement, where it came from, the impact I think it's already had on the conservative movement. Um, you know, it's different factions. You will find that libertarianism, just like conservatism, just like a lot of the isms, have a variety of different factions, different approaches. Uh, Ron Paul comes from a particular school within, I'd say, the libertarian movement. There are other schools. There are other perspectives on, on, uh, on some of the issues he addresses. So I'd like to cover that, and then I'd like to talk about Ayn Rand subjectivism. Um, you know, what, what's unique about it, what's different about it than, than uh, uh, libertarianism. And then talk about the future, talk about how I think this plays out uh, as we move into the future. To understand, I think both the growth, the, the growth of modern conservatism and the growth of modern libertarianism, I think you really have to go back to post-World War II America. Uh, and understand kind of where we were at that point. 1944, 1945, the war is ending. We just defeated uh, Hitler and the Japanese, two you know, fascist empires with ideas of world domination, but two ideologically heavily collectivistic regimes, right? regimes that emphasize collectivism. At the same time, the largest collectivistic uh, ideology, a most dominant one of 1940s, is what? It's communism, as embedded in, in the Soviet Union and just a few years later in Mao's China. So communism is dominant. It's on the rise. Indeed, we hand over, uh, for another lecture, we hand over the whole of Eastern Europe to communism at the end of World War II. Uh, and the world, as you follow in the late 40s and early 50s, slowly, country after country, is falling under the spell of communism. This is an ideology that really has enthralled people. Uh, at the same time, in the United States itself, we are emerging from the Great Depression, an era where the collectivism, these ideas of state control, these ideas of sacrificing individual liberty for the sake of of the state for the sake of the economy, for the sake of the group. Uh, we have just gone through over a decade, 15 years, of significant increase in the size of government, the role of government, and this notion that it's okay to sacrifice the individual for the group, that it's okay to sacrifice some individuals for the economy or for reducing unemployment. And there's a debate in the 40s. Has it worked or hasn't it worked? Right? To this day, I think we're having a debate, although I think outside one, it didn't work. but. You know, the debates, Krugman, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, I don't have a Nobel Prize, uh, would disagree with me, obviously. But this is a debate going on in the 40s. Uh, the fear is, among those who uh, admire individual liberty, who admire the Founding Fathers, who admire kind of pre-Great Depression, 19th century America, the fear is that collectivism is rising in America. It's not a fear, it's a reality and that collectivism is dominating the rest of the world in the form of the worst form of collectivism imagine, imaginable to man, which is communism. So that's the context. This, all this is going on. And in 1944, uh, I, and, and there were a number of thinkers during the 30s and 40s that are talking about this and that are arguing against collectivism, arguing against communism. I mean, Ayn Rand is in the mix here. She writes a novel in the 1930s called We the Living, which is uh, close to autobiographical. She, she came from the Soviet Union. She, she experienced communism. And she writes a book about communism. And just to give you a sense, the book was a complete you know, failure in terms of its sales because the intelligentsia in America in the 1930s were enamored by communism. They couldn't believe it was this bad. It only was in the 50s and the 60s when they realized what Stalin had done did the American left and the American intelligentsia realize that communism was really, really a bad thing. But in the 30s and 40s, they were enamored by this. So there were a lot of voices, but a, a, a small book published in the UK and England in 1944 really seemed to resonate a lot with both conservatives and, and many who, uh, who were worried about the rise of collectivism. And that is The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek. Uh, Hayek is probably... Um, probably if you look today, probably the most influential libertarian thinker uh, of modern times. Certainly the most influential libertarian thinker on conservatism. They might have been more important libertarian thinkers qua libertarianism, but in terms of the impact on conservatives, Hayek is probably 
had the most impact. And conservatives like him, and you'll see why they like him in a minute. Uh, Hayek was, a, uh, was an Austrian, uh, an economist, a brilliant economist, one of, the, one of the really great economists of the 20th century, a free market economist, a, a, a clearly an advocate for minimal government intervention. Uh, and he writes The Road of Sodom. The Road of Sodom is this book that describes, uh, basically the thesis is this. If you allow governments to grow, if you plant the seed of collectivism, what you get in the end is authoritarianism. He says Nazism doesn't come out of nowhere. Nazism is the consequence of the seed of collectivism that it took years and years and years to cultivate in Germany, and in the end you get fascism. Communism didn't come out of nowhere. It's the seed of collectivism that slowly government grows, slowly implants itself, it changes people's attitudes about life, and you get communism. And he said what's happening in the West in the 1940s, remember... Uh, I don't know if you, you won't remember, but maybe, maybe you've studied history enough to, to, to know that you know, Churchill won World War II for the UK. I mean, Churchill is a giant. Right? But in the elections of 1946, or 1945, I think, Churchill is voted out of office. He just won the war. You'd think this guy would storm, you know, the elections would be easy. He loses, and he loses to the socialists. He loses to the British Labor Party because the West is moving left so fast that even Churchill can't win an election. So Hayek is warning the British that this is what's going to happen. Uh, the book comes to America. It becomes a huge success here. It, uh, you know, it, it sells many, many copies. Uh, spurs a lot of thinkers to come out of the woodwork in support of these ideas. Now, Hayek, uh, at the same time as he clearly believes in free market and is a strong free market advocate in certain areas, certainly from an economics perspective, he's, a, again, a brilliant economist. But he's also a compromiser a little bit because Hayek also says, look, the state does have a role here and there in facilitating competition and helping the markets along. You know, so he's not a purist when it comes to markets. He allows for significantly more government than many libertarians did at the time and will, you know, post Hayek. And this is why conservatives like him, because he's not a purist, and conservatives are not purists when it comes to free markets, right? I mean, conservatives do not believe in limited government, limiting it to, you know, setting up property rights and leaving the markets alone, right? Which is what, as we'll talk about, what libertarians hold. Conservatives want to tinker. I mean, you can see it in this presidential campaign. I mean, uh, who are the conservatives? St. Thomas, the conservative, he wants to tinker. He wants to give special privileges to manufacturers because manufacturing is better than service. Why? Because St. Thomas decided, right? And we can have an argument whether that's true or not. But the point is he, qua politician, wants to dictate to the marketplace that manufacturing is better than this. Or, or you know, Gingrich wants to give these tax favors and those tax Each one of them wants to manipulate the market in a different way based on their agenda. And that's typical of conservatives. Conservatives are not hands-off. You know, completely hands-off, right? So Hayek kind of bridges. He's, he's got a foot here and a foot there. He never considered himself a conservative. Uh, he actually wrote a whole essay on why I'm not a conservative, where he criticizes conservatives. I mean, one of the biggest criticisms he have is, is, is the word, right? Where does the word conservative comes from? It comes from the word conserve. Well, what exactly are we trying to conserve, right? Things suck, right? To put it, I don't know if I can say suck on video, but, you know, <laughs> things are bad. What do we want to conserve about the things that exist today, right? What do we want to conserve about the things that existed the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years? So he, he considered himself uh, as all libertarians consider themselves, I mean, it's a kind of an interesting twist. Libertarians consider themselves liberals, but not modern liberals. Liberals of the past, 19th century-like liberals. They consider themselves progressives because they're for progress. Not leftist progressives, not progressives that need government in order to move things forward, but they want to leave the markets alone to progress. But they are revolutionaries, they're radicals, they're not conservatives in the sense of wanting to conserve. At least that's, you know, Hayek's, Hayek's view. And, and if, if you read, there's a, there's a new website that the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian uh, think tank, has just uh, started a few months ago called libertarianism.org. If you go there, 
and you trace the way they write, the way the libertarians write about their history, they trace their roots to every kind of free thinker, liberal thinker, liberal meant free thinker. Uh, uh, you know, they, the, the liberals in America stole the word. They reversed its meaning. The pro-capitalists, 100 years ago, were all liberals. And, the, the, you know, modern liberals flipped the term. They, Ayn Rand calls it a stolen concept. They stole the concept from the right and turned it into a leftist concept. So they traced themselves back to the Greeks and the Romans and Cicero and to the Founding Fathers and so on. And, uh, so, so Hayek is a, is, a, is a crucial figure. He ultimately comes and teaches at the University of Chicago. We'll talk about the University of Chicago in a minute because there's another branch kind of libertarianism that comes out of there. Um, another important figure that I just want to mention here because I think he represents, from my perspective at least, kind of the pure form of libertarianism and the and the more rational form of libertarianism is, is, a, is a, probably the greatest economist of the 20th century. Um, and that is a guy named Ludwig von Mises, uh, M-I-S-E-S. And von Mises, also Austrian, and indeed the school of thought that combines von Mises and Hayek is called the Austrian School of Economics. And in my view, the best school of economics out there. So the, they get it. Um, von Mises was actually Hayek's teacher. Uh, Hayek, when he came to study with von Mises, was actually a socialist, and von Mises turned him into a capitalist. He flipped him. Uh, so uh, von Mises is responsible for, for, for you know, giving us the economist that is Hayek. Uh, von Mises was, a, was a, a, again, the great economist and a, and a purist here. I mean, von Mises believed that government has only one role, and that is in the economic sphere, that is the protection of property rights. You set up the rules for property rights, and then you go catch the crooks, right? Catch the fraudsters, catch the criminals. But other than that, no regulations, no incentives, no manipulation of the market, no all of these regulatory agencies that we have today, no government involvement in the economy. None. I mean, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> but no FDA, no SEC. No, uh, you know, uh, Department of Commerce. I don't know what they do. I guess they, they take CEOs around the world and show them off. Um, no Department of Labor. No special rules for unions. Unions can form, but they get no government privileges. Uh, nothing. No government involvement in the economy. Leave it alone. Okay. Uh, and Mises, uh, Mises, I think, you know, has a huge influence on kind of the libertarian movement, again, particularly among economists. And notice that the main libertarians, the, 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 the most important libertarians are all economists. Uh, libertarianism really comes out of, and this is kind of the, the utilitarian grounding, they come out of an economic understanding of the world, from an economic understanding of how markets work. And they say, markets work, what do we need government for? We'll see that Ayn Rand approaches this differently. But their view is, you know, this is what happens in economics, right? If you leave people alone, all these good things happen. And if you look at history, when we leave markets alone, boom, standard of living goes up. Boom, GDP goes up. Quality of life goes up. Uh, you know, we get industrialization. We get technology. We get iPhones. We get iPads. We get good stuff, right? When you regulate, when you control, you get crises. You get poverty. You get decline. You get recessions. You get distortions in the marketplace. So... Purely economic analysis. If we don't have an FDA, you know, private entities will come up to rank, rate drugs or, or to test our food or to do that. We don't need the FDA because the economics, will, the incentives of capitalism will drive private people to do that. And, we, you know, they'll be more trustworthy than the bureaucrat who does it. And for every one of these questions you might have, they have a really neat and I think true economic solution to how this would work under free markets how this would work under capitalism. Okay. So this is kind of the, 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 the von Mises school. Uh, uh, he's a purist when it comes to this. No government intervention. And probably, you know, within the libertarian movement, I would argue probably von Mises is the most uh, influential of the, of the uh, libertarian thinkers, the economists. He actually taught uh, at NYU. And it's interesting that both Hayek, and, uh, when he taught at uh, Chicago, Hayek ultimately taught uh, in London and uh, just as an aside, was very influential on Margaret Thatcher. So he, he sat at a place called uh, the uh, Institute for Economic Affairs. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, who completely changed uh, you know, the British economy and, and, and the UK, completely revolutionized it towards more freedom, 
I mean, she'll go down as one of the great political, in my view, and I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, she is bi- bigger than Ronald Reagan. I mean, she had, and there's no question about this, she had a more profound impact on the UK than Ronald Reagan had on the US. Uh, because the UK's was what, much worse shape than we were in, 19, uh, in the late 1970s. So she's a, um, she literally studied with Hayek. She, you know, she was there at AEI and, and they were Chad. He was probably in his 70s, 80s by that point. Um, but, uh, so he had a profound impact on the politics of, of the UK, at least under Thatcher. Uh, both Hayek and von Mises, when they got university positions in the US, they were funded with external grants. They couldn't get like tenure, regular tenure positions from the university because the universities, even then, were so dominated by collectivist, anti-free market, anti-capitalist forces that they had to get their own funding from foundations and from uh, institutions to be able to get their positions. Um, one th- a, third, uh, a third economist that I want to uh, quickly deal with uh, because he's so well-known and, and probably the most well-known libertarian is Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago, uh, you know, started a school, really started before him uh, by a guy named Frank Knight, but started a school called the, the University of Chicago School of Economics, um, is considered a, a libertarian, considered himself a libertarian, I think was considered a libertarian at the, uh, while he was alive, uh, was a big free market economist, uh, made a lot of arguments uh, for free markets. What's interesting about Milton Friedman, uh, particularly as compared to von Mises, is Mises and the Austrians, this Austrian school of economics, very much worked outside of mainstream economics. They were the fringe guys. They never published in the big journals. They, they didn't, you know, they, they weren't considered mainstream. Milton Friedman used the tools of conventional mainstream economics to, sh- to kind of advocate for free markets. And, and as a consequence, I think, became more well-known than they did, certainly within the field of economics. Even his opponents, you know, have a high regard for him. Um, he is a big advocate, again, of free markets. Markets work. Um, markets, uh, leaving individual alone is right. Um, and, it, and it just, and it works, you know. And, and again, this goes back to Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith writing in The Wealth of Nations, 1776 shows that when you leave individuals alone, the economy succeeds, the economy grows. Um, Friedman uh, is very successful at Chicago. Uh, you have today in, at universities all over America, uh, many of his students, uh, in a terms of influence on the field of economics, much bigger than, than, uh, than the others. Uh, although Friedman, like I think a little bit like Hayek, compromises. So uh, there's a big debate among libertarians about do we need a central bank or don't we need a central bank? Uh, you'll see again that I think Ayn Rand approaches a question like that very differently. But uh, Milton Friedman comes down at least most of his life on the side of yes, we do, although towards the end of his life, supposedly he changed his mind and said we don't need a central bank. Hayek, again, depends on what you read. Sometimes he's for central bank, sometimes he's against. Mises was never for central bank, always for free banking, uh, no central bank. And, and uh, many of the today's Austrian economists uh, support that position of no need for a central bank um, today. So I think these are the three big economists who, who really shaped and had an influence on the world out there, certainly in terms of their economic uh, teaching. And so so what, what, is, what unites them? Um, what unites them is a, is a respect for the marketplace, a respect for capitalism, a respect for how markets work, and the idea that if markets are left alone, they not only solve the problems, but they create wealth. They, you know, they create enormous amounts of wealth. They allow the poor to rise up from poverty. You know, they allow technolo- technological innovation. They allow creativity. They allow for everything that we want, right. materially at least, they make possible. And much of what we want spiritually is made possible by the fact that we have wealth. You know? So if you really enjoy listening to music, which is a spiritual activity, right? Um, you know, the world is much richer in terms of your opportunity to enjoy music when you're wealthy than when you have a society that's poor, right? It's wealthy society created iPads, iPods, right? That you can listen to music everywhere and where, where a band with no support and no money can go on the internet and record its music and have it heard everywhere. I mean, the, the level of opportunity that exists in a field like music, like a non-material field, right, is huge because 
of technology because of wealth. It didn't exist 200 years ago because the technology wasn't there. And why wasn't the technology not there? Because the wealth wasn't there and the science wasn't there. All of these support one another. So they come at it, again, from this perspective of it works. Um, I want to talk about one other uh, kind of uh, part of the libertarian movement, which I think is significant. And as you go out there and meet libertarians, you'll encounter uh, this group. So I don't want to be accused of, uh, of not including uh, one group. And that is um, the anarchists. These are the libertarians who believe that there should be no government. Mises, Hayek, uh, Friedman all believe there should be government. We'll talk about what, what the government's role is mentioned a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. But this school believes there should be no government. And again, not surprising, it's led for the most part by an economist, uh, a, a, an economist by the name of Maui Rothbard, uh, who uh, I think at least at the end of his career was at the University of uh, Las Vegas. Um, and uh, this is the idea that <laughs> why stop at privatizing the post office and privatizing schools and private, let's privatize the police force and let's privatize the military. And let's have you know competing governments in a sense of competing police forces and 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 uh, and so on. Um, you, you know this view this view is uh, is very strongly held out there. Um, there. There's a big faction today uh, of of the libertarian movement, if there is such a thing, of people who call themselves libertarians who believe in anarchy. Uh, it's it's uh, a lot of the intellectuals today within the, the who call themselves libertarians are advocates for an anarchy. And it doesn't just manifest itself in no government, but a sudden hatred of government, a sudden resentment of government. So government is the biggest initiator force, the biggest violator of our rights, and we hate it and we resent it. And, and you know, there's a sudden element of truth there. There's a real element of truth. The biggest violator, the biggest imposer of force on your lives today is government. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, What's interesting is that it's, it also has an element of a real anti-U.S. government. For, for whatever reason, the, a, the anarchists tend to hate American government more than they hate any other government, uh, it, which, you know, I, I, don't ask me to explain. You'd have to ask one of them to explain. But it, it really is in there. And, and, you know, when I talk about Ron Paul, I, you know, there's a certain element of this in Ron Paul, which, uh, which I think is, is interesting. He's influenced by this part of the libertarian Sight of it, uh, this this element of anarchist, anti-government, anti-U.S. government uh, is is I think definitely there. Um, so, what impact of, of these things has had on on the American political scene? Um, not much, not much. I mean, I think they've had an impact on people's ideas. They've had an impact on what people say, maybe even on what people think. But I'd say they've had almost no impact on what conservatives actually do um, in a sense of what they do when they get to power, when they get into a position of doing something. So many people in the Reagan administration, I think, would have considered themselves libertarian, economic libertarians in a sense of believing in a very, very minor role of government. But they didn't do much. The fact is the government under Reagan grew. It didn't shrink. Now, it grew at a slow rate. It was deregulated, but deregulation had already started under Jimmy Carter. Indeed, you know, again, not popular among conservatives, but the fact is that much of the benefits that Reagan uh, got were a result of deregulation that occurred under Jimmy Carter and under actual, actually under Ford. Ford is the one who really started, and then Carter, you know, it used to be that the government controlled the price of airplane tickets. Yep, and Jimmy Carter deregulated that. It used to be that the, that the government controlled the tariff for trucking, how much trucks could charge businesses for trucking. Jimmy Carter deregulated that. Financial uh, services were far more so broker. Broker fees used to be regulated. Uh, how much a bank could pay on your saving account used to be regulated. Uh, called Regulation Q. Um, all of that was deregulated in the 70s, right? under Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, not under Reagan. So Reagan benefited from the fact that there was already some momentum towards deregulation. So with some deregulation, they were suddenly cutting taxes, um, but there was no shrinkage of government. Ronald Reagan came into office saying I was going to do away with the Department of Education. The Department of Education by the end of his second term was far bigger than it was when he started. 
Um, so the language of kind of the libertarian pro-free markets was there. The actions, not so much. And when we talk about RAND, I'll try to explain why that is. Um, the, uh, you see it in the verbiage even of the, of the, of the presidential candidates. I mean, Mitt Romney will say, you know, we need to shrink government dramatically, and I'm for individual rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the next sentence, he's telling you which industries he's going to subsidize and which industries he's going to penalize and how he's going to increase, how he's going to go after the Chinese and help the Americans and do all this and manipulate the economy. So it enters in certain areas, but it hasn't sunk in. So it seems like a lot of the candidates, the conservative candidates, need to talk the talk, but they don't actually walk the walk, unfortunately. I mean, I, and I won't even start with George Bush, because yeah. <laughs> where do you end if you start there? And, and it's not Bush's fault, right? He had a, cons he had a House and a Senate. There were all Republicans. Uh, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of conservatives there. Uh, how many of you know, you've heard of Sarbanes-Oxley? I know you've got... Sarbanes-Oxley, one of the biggest regulatory bills maybe since the 1930s, was passed in 2002. Uh, probably cost the U.S. economy somewhere in the range of, I've seen estimates of around one and a half trillion dollars of shaved off of GDP. Um, a, a horrific, horrific, stupid law, which has caught, you know how many crooks it's caught? Because this came after Enron and WorldCom and all, all the fraud that happened. You know how many crooks it's caught? Zero. Bernie Madoff happened anyway. The housing crisis and, and whatever Wall Street shenanigans happened anyway. It did nothing. Anyway, you know how many conservatives voted against this in, uh, at the, in the Senate? None, because the thing passed 97 to zero. Conservatives talk the talk. They don't walk the walk when it comes to economic liberty. At least that's the history. And that's why, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who's in the White House, government has grown since the teens. For 100 years, government has only grown. Government intervention in the economy has only grown. In spite of that deregulation, there were other areas that were very quickly re-regulated and regulated anew and new taxes and new programs and more redistribution of wealth and more programs. And we saw that definitely under Bush, one of the most, uh, the biggest regulators and biggest, uh, you know, expanders of government programs since probably Lyndon B. Johnson. Right. Okay, so let's, let's sum up quickly here. Um, libertarians stand for economic freedom. They stand for individual freedom. So let, let, quickly on the social issues. Libertarians generally, their general principle is live and let live. You know, none of your business. I should be able to do whatever I want to do as long as I don't hurt you, as long as I don't violate your rights. It's not the goal of government to legislate morality. It's not the goal of government to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body. This is why you will, you will see that, you know, libertarians will advocate for legalization of drugs legalization of prostitution. They will tend to be pro-abortion, and they will tend to be, um, you know, in these days, pro-gay marriage, right? So they, they will deviate from the conservative message on all of those, and indeed from mainstream America quite a bit on, on, on many of those. But, you know, and, and you've seen it. Ron Paul's always pushed on the drugs issue. He says he'd legalize marijuana, but what he really, really believes is that all drugs should be legalized. And, I think you can make a really solid argument for that. It's interesting that, that the founder of, maybe the founder of modern conservatism, uh, William F. Buckley, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, believed in uh, drug legalization, but not because of an individual freedoms issue. He believed in drug legalization from a utilitarian perspective. He believed it created too much crime and created too many people in jail. And therefore, just from an efficiency perspective, it didn't make any sense. The libertarians believe in it, not just from an efficiency perspective, but from an individual kind of liberty perspective. So their view is, again, and I'm putting the anarchists aside because I think the anarchists are very different, and let's keep them to the side. Um, I think the mainstream libertarian position generally in politics is um, as long as you're not violating somebody else's rights, you should be able to do pretty much anything you want to do. It's not the role of government to tell you what you can and cannot do. Right? Live and let live. And it, that boils down to a principle um, which you could probably, you know, uh, bring back to the formulation to Ayn Rand. Maybe there were other thinkers that came up with similar formulations. But the principle of non-initiation of force. The idea that as long as you're not using force on somebody else, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. That's the principle that, that libertarians 
and in politics that objectivists, Ayn Rand would hold, the non-initiation of force principle. And that the role of government, the role of government, is to prevent the initiation of force and to retaliate when that force is initiated. So when somebody you know, runs at me with a club to try to beat my head in, ideally the role of government is to step in, handcuff him, and take him to jail before he gets to me. Now, and if he's already clubbed me, then the idea is it shouldn't be my responsibility to chase after him. We want a specialized force, a police force, to chase him, get him, put him in jail. That's the role of government. When, you know, and again, military, so three functions, military, police, judiciary, that's it. And really, they're all involved in extracting force from society. Now, why do libertarians hold this as a first principle? Because they do. <laughs> because that's what they believe in. And we'll see that this is Rand's biggest objection here, because she believes you need a philosophical foundation. You can't just start with politics. Politics is an outcome, not the end. It's the end game. It's not the beginning. It's not the be-all, end-all. Libertarians believe in a big tent. They, as we said, include anarchists. They include some people willing to compromise on the role of government. But they also philosophically include utilitarians. They include uh, Catholic priests. They include um, Kantians, you know, Kant's philosophy. They include, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, natural rights. They include all kinds of philosophies. They have, libertarianism has nothing to say about how you come to the principle of non-initiation of force. It's just as long as you accept it, you're okay. Okay? So let me flip here. This is a good, a good transition to Ayn Rand because Ayn Rand disagrees. Rand claims that the reason we can't hold on, that we can't win the battle for limited government, the, for this capitalist economy, the reason we can't win it is because most people don't care about economics. Economics is not what life's about. It's not just about wealth. It's not just about how much GDP we can create or what kind of iPhone we could get. But it's much more, there are much more important values, that there are much more important things involved here. That people indeed don't vote their pocketbook. If they voted their pocketbook, we would have capitalism in America today. Because clearly capitalism is better for your pocketbook than is state intervention, statism. We've got, the economics have been done on that, right? We've got great economists. You know, by the way, Hayek and Friedman won Nobel Prizes. It's not just Krugman. Um, we've had lots of, lots of economists who've shown free markets work. The libertarians have done that, right? People don't vote their pocketbook. People want to believe that what they're doing is right. It's just. It's fair. It's good. People care about moral values. And ultimately what drives politics is not economics. It's morality. Even the challenge between individualism and collectivism, which is what seems to spur collect uh, the, the conservatives and the and the libertarians, but neither the conservatives, in Rand's view, neither the conservatives nor the libertarians have defended individualism. Because the question is why? Why shouldn't we view people as groups? And indeed, I would argue, Rand would argue, that most conservatives are collectivists. Again, I'll, I'll give you Rick Santorum. What is the unit, the unit of morality, the unit of politics, the unit of economics for Rick Santorum? The family, not the individual. He has a long speech in which, I think it's an interview, in which he says individual happiness is not the goal. This is where I think he departs dramatically from the founders. The family is the goal. The solidity of the family, the, however you want to define it. That's collectivism. Whenever you, the, goal, the unit of measurement is more than one person, is a group, it's collectivism. And of course that leads to policy, right? If the unit is the family, now it's not about individual freedom. It's about what's good for the family. And if I can outlaw divorce, maybe that's good for the family, so I'll outlaw divorce. 
the, the standard becomes completely different. And this is the problem conservatives face, is they, they don't have a defense of individualism. But neither do the libertarians. Because neither conservatives nor libertarians want to challenge what's at the root of collectivism, according to Rand. And what's at the root of collectivism is the morality of altruism. Now, what is altruism? Again, everything I'm saying is according to, to Rand. Altruism is not being nice to other people. Being nice to other people is just being benevolent. Altruism is not helping other people necessarily. Altruism is the idea, the philosophy that says, the morality that says, that the well-being of other people is your primary moral responsibility. So when you think about the good, the good is what I can do for other people, not what I can do for myself. Altruism versus egoism or self-interest. So the unit is other people. Immediately that's non-individualistic. It's about others. It's not about self. It's not about pursuing your happiness, right? Remember the Declaration of Independence says, it doesn't say you have a right to, uh, you know, be your brother's keeper, uh, go and help your fellow man, be Mother Teresa. No, it says pursue happiness. That's pretty selfish of the founders, right? And you have an inalienable right that cannot be taken away by anybody to pursue happiness. So, at the root of collectivism, Rand tells us, is altruism, is this notion of sacrifice, that virtue comes from sacrifice. You know, I like to tell the story of Bill Gates. Right? Bill Gates made gazillions of dollars during the 1990s and 2000s with Microsoft. And what did we think of him morally while he was making all his money? Now, we thought he was a great businessman, but what did we think he was, a, you know, Mother Teresa, Bill Gates, on the same axis? No. Right? Mother Teresa is a saint. He's like, eh, he's a businessman. He's out to make money. Morally, we don't think much of him at all. Okay, so he retires, and he sets up a foundation, and he's giving it away. Ooh, now he's a good guy. Now he's moral, because he's giving it away. And I could guarantee him sainthood. Now, I'm not a Catholic, and I haven't talked to the Pope, but I think this would work. Right? He could get sainthood if he gave it all away, and if you moved into like a hut or a tent or something, <laughs> right? And if he bled a little bit and showed some suffering, that would help too. It's true. Now my moral code, other people chose it. But this is true. So in this country, we don't admire ethically the creation of wealth. The creation of wealth, eh. We admire when we give it away. I, I actually, a year ago, about a year ago, I gave a talk here at, in Charleston. There was a luncheon event and I, uh, that was sponsored by the Citadel Business School uh, that honored uh, local business leaders. And it was, it was they, they got awards, and I can't remember who exactly what, how the sponsorship worked, but I, I was the keynote speaker. And, uh, but everybody went up and introduced the businessmen who were getting the awards, and it was fascinating. Because, and it, was, and it fit right into my thesis, so it was perfect. They spent two minutes describing their business achievements, the wealth they created, the employment they created, you know, the great standard of living they provided for their family and for themselves. And then they spent 15, 20 minutes describing their philanthropy and their community service. I mean, that is just bizarre. It's bizarre. Now, why is that? When Bill Gates made gazillions of dollars, how much did he help all of us? We all bought his products. Did he help us? Did he make us better? By a huge amount. By amount, many, many multiples of how much money he made. He helped us. He helped poor people all over the world. The fact that Microsoft has standardized software all over on computers, made networking possible, ultimately makes the internet possible in the form that we have today, and ultimately has benefited people all across the world, billions of people, many, many folds over what he actually earned. I believe he helped many, many more people in a much more profound way than when he gives it away. I, I think there's no question. And I think there's no question that under Microsoft he helped many, many more people in a more profound way than Mother Teresa ever, ever did. But what's the difference? 
He earns a return on helping them. He made money in the process. He helped himself by helping other people. That is unacceptable. That's why when he stopped making money and he just gave it away, even though he's helping fewer people and not as well, he's, good, he's a good guy. That's what altruism demands. It demands that you give without the expectation of getting. That's what sacrifice is, right? Sacrifice is giving and not getting. Sacrifice is lose-win, right? You lose, somebody else wins. At least on this earth as we understand it. That's what it means, right? Trade, which is what Bill Gates did, is what? When I trade something with you, I, I sell you a car and you pay me $20,000. Who lost? I won because the car was worth less than 20000 to me, so I made a little bit of a profit, right? And you won because the car was worth more than $20,000. That's why you're willing to give up the 20000 Win, win. All voluntary trades, the intention at least, not they don't always work like that, you sometimes buy a lemon, but all trades are intended to be win-wins. Win-win, from a moral perspective, in our culture, nah. Win-lose, all right. If somebody lost, it must be good. I mean, that's bizarre. But that's what altruism demands. And then when we, and then, if it's okay to sacrifice, no, if it's the epitome of virtue to sacrifice, then how can we complain when our taxes go up? All government is trying to do is help somebody. They're trying to get us to give more so that somebody else is better off, supposedly. Right? How can we complain when people are being regulated? What do we know about self-interest? What are we, the, the flip side of altruism is our perception of self-interest. What do we think of self-interested people? If I say that person's selfish, what do, what do we think immediately? Without even thinking, what comes to our mind? Bad. bad. He's bad. If he's self-interested, he's bad. He's probably, why is he bad? Because he's probably lying, cheating, stealing, right? He's Bernie Madoff. Right? So, what a businessman. What's capitalism about? What's business about? It's about making money and making great products, but the products you want to make. Right? I, I, I love the iPhone example because uh, you know, Steve Jobs made a lot of money on these. Right? Profit margin is about 60%. If you really cared about me, you'd sell it cheaper. But he doesn't. He wants to make money. But he also, how many, how many uh, you know, customer surveys did he did before he designed this? Zero. None. He created what he wanted to create, and he figured I'd like it. But he did what he wanted. Steve Jobs was a self-interested, call him selfish businessman. All businessmen are. That's, the, that's why we're so embarrassed by them. That's why we only spend two minutes describing their business activities, because it's selfish. We all know it. We know capitalism is about a bunch of people pursuing self-interest. Adam Smith understood that in 1776. The baker doesn't bake the bread to make you better off. He doesn't care about you. He makes the bread to make a living. And he gives you good customer service, not because he loves you, but because that's how he sells more bread. Right? That's the reality. We all, are in the business world, are after self-interest. And yet self-interest is lying, stealing, cheating. I mean, they're going to take from me. Of course we want regulations. We want government bureaucrats who are not self-interested, right, because they're, they're, they're for the common good, right, to, to monitor this and to, and to make sure I use, in the article I think you all read, I used elevator inspectors, right? Don't you feel a lot more comfortable going into elevators and seeing that little thing that a government inspector has set? Because we know, we know that if the government didn't inspect elevators, elevator makers would make elevators that killed us. Because that's how businessmen make money, by killing their clients and customers. I mean, it's insane. But, but if you don't spell it out, well, of course, elevator, they're selfish. They'll try to cut corners and make a quick buck. But making a quick buck is going to destroy them. That's not rational. That's not really self-interested. OK, I need to speed up a little bit. But, so you can see how there's a conflict between capitalism, free markets, and altruism. People vote their altruism. They don't vote their understanding of markets. They want to be good. And, and, and Obama understands this really really well. Notice how he's phrasing this election. This is not an election about the economy, not from a GDP perspective. This is an election about fairness. 
about the kind of economy and the kind of world we want to live in in the future. He's about the vision thing, and he's got it. He's framing this as a, an election about morality, not about economics, because he loses in economics. But he has a chance of winning in the morality. This is what Rand challenges. She says, yes, you economists, you're all right. This, you know, the, the way you've described the economy, particularly von Mises, it works, that's right. And everybody who's willing to work is better off. But that's not the reason that capitalism is a good thing. That's not a reason to be an individualist and to advocate for freedom. The reason is that it's moral. But she can only say that because she rejects altruism. She can only say that because she's willing to challenge every secular philosopher of the last, you know, 1,000 years, more, 2,000 years, since Aristotle, with a few exceptions here and there, who basically said that your purpose in life is to sacrifice for others. She's willing to, to challenge, you know, what many consider the Judeo-Christian tradition of morality, which is altruism. So she is an advocate for a different morality. She is an advocate for the morality of self-interest. She says the purpose in life, your purpose in life, each one of you, is to pursue your life, to make your life the best that it can be, to live the most flourishing, successful, happy life that you can. And by the way, and I can't prove it now, but if you want, you can ask me in the Q&A, that doesn't involve lying, cheating, stealing, because lying, cheating, stealing turn out to be incredibly self-destructive. It involves leading a rational, long-term life of honesty and a sense of justice and, and, and integrity. Okay. And if you, know, if you capture, if you believe in a morality of self-interest, a morality that says, my life's the standard. I don't want to live for somebody else. I'm not your servant. I don't owe you anything unless we're trading. I don't owe my life to any group, to any other individual. I am here for me. And yes, I want to trade with you guys in all kinds of ways. Some of them material, some of them spiritual. Right? But I don't want to, you to sacrifice for me. I don't want to give me, you to give me stuff I haven't earned. And I don't want to give you stuff you haven't earned. I want this to be win-wins. So that kind of morality, that kind of morality, is the, she believed is the only morality consistent with the founding of this country. Because it's the only morality consistent with the sentence in the Declaration about the inalienable right to your life, each one of your lives. And the founders were talking about individual lives. They weren't talking about the American life or the group's life. Or they were talking about individuals. Your liberty. It's your ability to think what you want to think and do what you want to do and pursue your values that you choose. Not that somebody else chooses for you. Not that the group decides is in a common good. But what you decide is in your good. And, of course, in the most selfish political statement in human history, to pursue your own happiness. That's the essence of our morality. It's about pursuit of happiness. Well, that links up completely with a political system that says, go pursue your happiness. Think about an individual that's only concerned about the pursuit of his own happiness. Right? And, you know, is consistent about that. What kind of government does he want? Does he want a government that sits on his shoulder like a paternalistic mother and he says, don't do that, don't eat that, oh, no, no, trans fats, that's no good for you. You know, don't go into that elevator, an inspector wasn't there. You know, don't go west, young man. Don't take risks. Don't, you know, don't invent an iPhone. Invent this, you know, what they call a camel is a horse created by a government committee. Um, you know, that, you don't, do you want to like, no, somebody who wants to pursue their own life, to pursue their own interests, to pursue their own passions, to pursue their own values, to make of themselves the best that they can be, that person wants to be left alone. He doesn't want people telling him what to do. And not just telling him. Government doesn't just tell, right? Government has a big gun. Government puts a gun at your back and says, don't eat trans fats, or you go to jail. Uh, no, no, they haven't got, well, trans fats in New York. I, think, I, think, I still think you can eat them here in, in uh, Charleston. 
But uh, you, you probably can't smoke here, even in private property where people might want you to smoke. You still can't smoke. You go to jail. If I own a restaurant, why should I not allow smoking? You don't like smoking, don't come. It's very simple. Private property, right? I can, I can smoke in my own house. Why can't I smoke in my own business? Same thing, private property. If you don't like my business, don't walk in. I certainly, I know my wife would never walk into a business where there was smoke. She hates it. Fine. Her rights and now business owners' rights both to being protected. She doesn't have to go into the store. The store owner doesn't have to let her in if he doesn't like her, if she's smoking. Right? That's freedom. <laughs> freedom is the ability to do what you want to do with your stuff. As long, again, as you're not hurting somebody. Yeah. Um, so that, so, so Rand views that as a, as a core foundational idea, the morality of self-interest for the establishment of limited government. You're not going to get the limited government of the founders. You're not going to be able to sustain that without a new morality, without the rejection of altruism. And you cannot get the new morality without, and I don't have time to really get into this, without something even more fundamental than that. So Ayn Rand said she was an advocate for capitalism because she was an advocate of individualism. She was an advocate of individualism because she was an advocate of self-interest. And she was an advocate of self-interest because she was an advocate of reason. So even when it comes to a more fundamental philosophical point, she believes that unless, unless we agree that reason is the standard for knowledge, we'll never get the rest. Okay. So the fundamental, I think, difference between you know, the von Mises type libertarian and Rand is that the libertarian is willing to accept any philosophical foundation. Rand accepts only a particular philosophical foundation and argues that without it, you can't get what the libertarian wants to get, which is that limited government. Okay. Uh, leave you with this question, you know, which I think of. What do you think the founders were? Were the founders conservatives? If they were conservatives, what were they trying to conserve? Were the founders libertarians? I mean, it didn't really exist as a, as a thought, but were they, were they consistent with libertarians? Founders, I mean, they couldn't have been objectivists because there was no objectivism back then, but what were they? Um, and how would they have defined themselves back then? Because everybody wants them, right? We all want the founders because in, in this country, liberals want them, the conservatives want them, you know, because we all have a healthy respect for them. We all have this emotional tie to them. But, but think about it, you know, uh, they were revolutionaries. They were radicals. They were way out there. If this is where the mainstream world was, the founders were way, way out there. And this is, I think, the most important contribution. This is what, what makes America special and what, if we don't recapture, we're lost. Uh, everywhere in the world, before the founding of this country, your life as an individual, your body as an individual, your soul as an individual, belonged to someone else. It belonged to the tribe. It belonged to the king. It belonged to the pope. It belonged to some other group. The world was a collectivistic world, all of it. There were no exceptions. What's unique about this country is that it's for the first time it was founded on a truly radical revolutionary principle. This is what the revolution is about. It's a rejection of that idea. You do not belong to anybody but yourself. This country was founded on the principle, if you will, of self-ownership. That's what individual rights mean. You own yourself. And that is, yes, there were thinkers that led up to that, from John Locke and the Enlightenment thinkers, but there was no political movement, no political movement that articulated that except for the founders. And that's what makes the American Revolution the greatest revolution by far. There's no other revolution that comes close. The fact that uh, Ginsburg, a Supreme Court judge of the United States, I don't know if you heard this, but she in an interview recently said that other countries shouldn't look to the United States Constitution as a model, but they should look at South Africa's and Canada's. Um, I mean, that's just absurd. But, you know, this is the greatest country that ever was because, ever in the history of mankind, because of that founding principle, because of that founding idea. And that's the founding principle that we need to recapture, whether you, whether you want to recapture it under conservatism or under something other label. If we could capture that notion that we own ourselves, that our lives is ours, 
to live as we please, to pursue, founders put it, to pursue our own happiness, then the future is ours. If we lose it, then the future is lost. We will go down that road to serfdom and the road that Atlas Shrugged uh, lays out, the road, uh, the road to collectivistic destruction. And on that gloomy note, thank you all. <laughs>